I'm Micah Smith with Denver 7, and welcome to Denver Decides. This community partnership is dedicated to accessible and transparent elections. The partnership includes the League of Women Voters of Denver, Interneighborhood Cooperation, and is presented by Denver 8 TV. Before we begin, we would like to extend a special thank you to our hosts for today's event, the Cherry Creek North Neighborhood Association and the Sixth Avenue United Church of Christ. Our mission today is to present a ballot issue forum in anticipation of the general election coming up on Tuesday, November 5th. Among the numerous amendments and ordinance questions on this year's ballot is Initiated Ordinance 309. This measure asks if Denver voters should adopt an ordinance prohibiting slaughterhouses as well as their construction, maintenance, and use in the city. Let's begin by meeting the participants who will discuss the pros and cons of Initiated Ordinance 309. Beginning at my right is Natalie Bolton, the social media lead with Pro Animal Future. She will be speaking in favor of Initiated Ordinance 309. And on my left is former City Councilwoman at large, Robin Kanich. She will be speaking in opposition to Initiated Ordinance 309. Let's welcome both of our speakers. We will begin with one minute opening statements from both speakers. Ms. Fulton, you are up first speaking for initiated ordinance 309. Thank you. Most Americans are deeply uncomfortable with the way animals are treated on factory farms and industrial slaughterhouses. It offends our sense of compassion for animals that most people in Denver share. 309 gives voters a chance to move away from some of the worst forms of intensive animal farming by banning industrial slaughterhouses in city limits. Superior Farms, the only facility, facility that would be impacted is the picture of the worst way of treating animals. It's the largest industrial lamb slaughterhouse in the US, brutally killing half a million six month old lambs every single year. Former workers describe rampant animal abuse and neighbors complain about the stench and severe pollution of the Platte River. Worst of all is the impact on the people who work there. Research shows slaughterhouse workers have 400% increases in depression, anxiety, and PTSD due to the unique psychological stress caused by killing animals all day. Okay. And now the opening statement from Ms. Kamich speaking against ballot initiated ordinance 309. Denver, I represented this community for 12 years. 309, the ban on slaughterhouses is wrong for our city because it unfairly targets just one employee owned business and puts them out of business. It's unfair to the 160 workers who will lose their jobs. One in four, women, 80% people of color. Workers like those here today with names and families, James, Carlos, Jennifer, Isabella, Gustavo, elders who aren't here today but rely on retirements funded by the employee-owned profits. Make no mistake, this ban provides not a cent of compensation nor new jobs for these workers. Listen, I was a vegetarian for 30 years. Even I know that banning one business is the wrong way to go about this. It won't change how people eat. It will result in more food coming from overseas, which is wrong for the environment. This ban doesn't mention and won't do anything to advance animal welfare. It is supported by groups that are not from our community and those within our community are united in opposition, respected Latino leaders from Global Liria Swansea, Labor and others. Thank you, Robin. And we've heard the opening statements from both of you. Now, Natalie, you will have an opportunity to ask Robin a question. Robin, you'll have 30 seconds to answer. Natalie, your question. According to OSHA, the turnover rate of kill floor employees in slaughterhouses typically exceeds 100% annually because of the extreme physical and psychological stress of killing animals all day. This is important because while Superior Farms advertises that they're employee owned, workers have to stay at the company for three years to qualify. A former employee told us almost no one lasts that long. What is the annual turnover rate for the workers who handle and kill animals? at Superior Farms. I think we've had enough lies on debate stages this week. Here are the facts. The employees of Superior Farms are owners of that facility. One quarter of those workers have been there for more than five years. Workers like Jennifer Valdez, who's here. One sixth of those workers have been at the company for more than 10 years. Folks like Gustavo and Isabella, who have a combined 55 years. These workers are paid at least $40,000 a year under the highest minimum wage in the country, and they get retirement benefits. 
All right, and now, Ms. Ganich, your turn to ask Ms. Fulton a question, and you will have 30 seconds to reply. Ms. Fulton, a leader of your organization stormed onto the stage and grabbed a microphone right out of the hands of Kamala Harris. On a recent podcast, that leader said that this ballot measure isn't about Denver, I quote, it's about ending all agriculture for meat nationally. Can you please explain to the 160 workers, the local businesses who will lose their business, the drivers, the ranchers, and can you please explain to Denver voters why we should be your experiment and how far you actually think it's okay to go to end eating meat? This is absolutely not an experiment on Denver. We have over 150 volunteers local to Denver in the community. Whether you're vegetarian, vegan, or eat meat, we can all agree that factory farming and industrial slaughterhouses are wrong, and Superior Farms is the face of factory farming here in Denver. We need to move away from this industry. 50% of Americans want to ban slaughter, and 68% of Americans feel that the factory farming of animals is one of the most important issues of our time period. Let's continue with the direct questions from our speakers. And Robin, another question for Natalie. As before, Natalie will have 30 seconds to respond. Thank you so much. You know, it's interesting, Ms. Fulton, that um, on a recent podcast, your leader shared that you were flying in a number of out-of-state activists to help with this campaign. I spoke to a woman who lives right here in the community. She's a Latina leader, and she actually shares your vision for the end of factory farming. And here's what she had to say about this measure. She said, it's short-sighted, ill-conceived, and it won't do anything to pave the way for change. It's done nothing to prepare for a just transition. So I'm just curious, why doesn't this measure say anything about animal welfare, environmental standards, or the workers that you're claiming you care so much about? And why did you start with eliminating the jobs of 160 workers without talking to them or to the local community you've tried to represent, you speak for? Sure. This measure came from a coalition of people concerned with animal cruelty, along with residents of Globeville who are sick of the intense air and water pollution. Industrial slaughterhouses are known to prey on marginalized communities like Globeville, which is majority Hispanic, and part of the most polluted residential zip code in the entire country. 309 was developed with help from Candy C. DeBaca, who was the councilwoman representing Globeville at the time the measure was submitted. We've also worked with the GES coalition to make sure we're considering their firsthand perspective. And now, Ms. Fulton, another question for Ms. Kanich. And Ms. Kanich, you will have 30 seconds for your response. Superior Farms has a serious record of legal violations. They've been sued by the federal government for animal cruelty, fined over $90,000 for labor violations, and violated the EPA's Clean Water Act for over four years and counting. The Denver plant was sued by employees for racial and religious discrimination and fraud. Why should Denver voters trust a multi-million dollar corporation headquartered in California with a proven record of breaking the law? Unlike you, I have spent time in this community and working with these workers about some of these questions. My parents worked in factory jobs, construction, and um, in factories, and those are also risky jobs. One single violation is not a pattern, and no one's ever asked for their job to be eliminated to keep them safe. They did miss some paperwork filings, and I hope to be able to talk more about that, but the regulatory process is working. This plant has never put any waste into this river from its production. It has a sanitary sewer permit, and it's in Thank full Thank you, Ms. Our next few rounds will feature our speakers responding to questions submitted by our forum organizers. Each speaker will answer each question, and they will have 30 seconds to do so. Natalie Fulton, who is here speaking in support of Initiated Ordinance 309, you will be first to answer this question. If slaughterhouses are outlawed in Denver, where will those workers who lose their jobs be able to find work without moving to a different county? We included a provision in our legislation to require the city of Denver to prioritize affected workers in their employment assistance program. This is a well-funded program with great opportunities for workers for better, safer jobs. We are confident they will be able to find better jobs than working in a slaughterhouse. Slaughterhouse workers have high rates of PTSD, depression, and substance abuse. No one wants to kill animals all day, and they shouldn't have to anymore. And now, Robin Kanich, who is speaking against Initiated Ordinance 309, your response to that question. Yes. No one spoke with these workers about what they want. They can work with their company to improve their conditions, and they have a method for doing that as employee owners. The fact is that Denver's assistance programs provide no cash assistance, 
They provide no guaranteed replacement jobs. The proponents have blithely suggested they should all just go work in construction. A similar hard job, also with phase B risks, but that's up to these workers. It's not for someone else to tell them where they should be. It's important that we work in community to really address challenges with the people who are impacted. And next question from our organizers for our guests. Robin, you'll respond first. You'll have 30 seconds. How will closing slaughterhouses in Denver make a positive impact on animal slaughter in general? Well, I don't believe this ban will have any impact on that. These are not factory farmed animals. This facility is um, taking in lambs who are free range and ranchers throughout the West. And it has really high standards. It is halal certified, which means that it is humane and it serves the Muslim community. It's the only source of halal lamb in Colorado. There are USDA inspectors on site, and it is regularly inspected like, by customers like Whole Foods who buy their products. Those are all protections to ensure that it is safe, and this measure includes no words you, about animal welfare. Okay. Your answer to that question, Natalie. A former Superior Farms employee said the number one thing he wants voters in Denver to know about the facility is rampant animal cruelty. Superior Farms has a recorded history of abusing animals. They were prosecuted by the federal government for multiple violations of humane slaughter regulations and failure to follow proper halal practices. That means consumers were buying halal meat when it shouldn't have been certified as halal. To position themselves as a leader of humane handling is dishonest, and the people of Denver will see right through it. Lambs regularly arrive dead to the slaughterhouse, which shows abuse across all areas of the supply chain. Now for our final round of submitted questions from the forum organizers. Natalie, you will be first to respond and have 30 seconds. Please indicate the top two financial contributors to your side of this issue. We see this as having a positive effect on the Globeville community. People don't want to open businesses near the slaughterhouse, and businesses that are currently there feel like they can't turn on their AC because the stench drives customers away. Globeville has poverty levels almost double the average in Denver. They are a mar marginalized community and have been left behind of Denver Denver's success. There are many successful businesses that could be run there. Slaughterhouses across the world have been turned into museums, breweries, and other businesses that will help the community and the neighborhood. So the question was to indicate the top two financial contributors to your side of the issue. Oh, my bad. Um, our top two contributors are a bunch of small donors. And I don't think there are top two. It's more of a mix of a lot of grassroots activists and other people. OK. Yep. Robin, can you your answer to the question? Thanks. I'd like the extra time as well. Thank you. Unfortunately, we had another lie in this debate stage. The searchlight system for campaign finance indicates only two contributors to this campaign. One is an out-of-state Bitcoin uh, tycoon, and another is a single C4 dark money organization. Um, our campaign, a majority of the fun funding for our campaign has come from Colorado donors. It comes from a broad coalition which has included contributions from labor unions. It comes from sheep ranchers who are independent from throughout the West, including here in Colorado. It comes from business associations. It's come from more than 50 individuals or we're small donors. And Robin, in the spirit of fairness, the top two financial contributors to your side of the issue. I don't have those exact names. I gave you the best um, data that I have available, which is this broad coalition, ranchers, livestock associations, and others. I don't have the names of those individuals. Okay. But I will ask folks if they want to check out the public finance reporting we've done on the Denver Searchlight System, as well as to go to Stop the Ban from Thank the you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, that does it for our questions. And now on behalf of the forum organizers, we would like to thank both of you for your participation in this forum. We hope we have given you a fair look at the pro and con arguments for initiated Ordinance 309. Again, it asks if Denver voters should adopt an ordinance prohibiting slaughterhouses, as well as their construction, maintenance, and use in the city. Our thanks also to the Denver Decides partners, which include the Interneighborhood Cooperation and the League of Women Voters of Denver. Denver Decides is presented by Denver 8 TV. We would like to extend a special thank you to our hosts for today's event, the Cherry Creek North Neighborhood Association and the 6th Avenue United Church of Christ. Remember, the election is Tuesday, November 5th. 
Let your voice be heard, be sure you are registered, and be sure to vote. For complete election information online, go to denverdecides.org. I'm Micah Smith with Denver 7. Thanks for joining us.